we use the camera each Sunday to record the sermons. That's part of our web page. And interestingly enough, we are getting hits and comments, and hopefully that will result in more people hearing the Word of God and coming to God's house. And as I was reading the text this morning, and it was describing the tongues of fire on the shoulders and the wind and the spirit, I was thinking of the uh, way that the tribe of Dan has embellished the words of that particular reading with the candles and the fire and the wind and thinking perhaps maybe that wind that we'll talk about this morning will be in the form of the Spirit and that we will all be inflamed, as it were, with God's Spirit and God's love. Thomas Kinsley was a pastor in Salem, New Hampshire, and he tells in one of his stories about a birthday card that he got for his dad. He got it on his dad's 75th birthday, and as many of us can attest to, when you go looking for a card for somebody you love, you're looking for that perfect card for that person that you want to say just the right thing for and to. And as he stood there in that card shop, his eyes kept drifting back to one particular card. And it was a drawing of two boats tied to a dock in what looked like a town in New England. Well, Kinsey lived in New England, but his parents didn't, never had. They lived in the hills of West Virginia, not anywhere close to water. In fact, his father had an experience in his childhood that made him fear water, and so he never even learned how to swim. And Thomas knew that, but he still kept drifting back to that card with the drawing showing the two boats. And he finally decided, well, he would get it anyway, because it, it was a very simple, a drawing of a very simple place, and it reminded him of a very simple time. And it also reminded him his dad thought of things in a very simple, even keel, type away. In fact, he, he thought if you drew a lifeline through his dad's life, it would be a straight line, and he would never veer very far off of that straight line, very predictable. His lifestyle was simple and uncomplicated. And as Thomas looked at his card, he noticed of the two boats, one was a rowboat, and the other was a sailboat. And so he thought, you know, if my dad had to make a choice between those boats, one of them, to cross this body of water that's shown in the card, which boat would he choose? So he bought the card, and then he shared those thoughts on the inside of the card with his dad. He asked his father this question. He said, in your simple style of living and with your ability to decide things that seem to make the most sense, which boat would you choose? Several weeks later, he received this response from his father. I noticed the rowboat had no engine but the sailboat had a sail. My question before making a decision would be, is there any wind? 
You know, today we celebrate the birthday of the church. And it's the day known as the day of Pentecost. Reverend King Duncan uses this illustration that I just cited in order in one of his sermons to discuss the question we want to ask this morning. The question is, is there any wind? Must we spend the rest of our days rowing, dependent only on our own power? Or might we put up our sails and catch the wind of God? Is there any wind? The story we read about this first day of Pentecost was in a meeting room in a house in Jerusalem. And in that house, there were 120 believers who went to pray just exactly as Jesus had told them to do. And while they were worshiping, they heard this great loud sound coming from the sky. And it was the wind, the wind which was howling like they had never ever heard it before. <coughs> they looked up and they saw what looked like giant tongues of fire, fire that was just above the shoulders. And they heard people speaking in different languages. And as the people spilled out onto the streets, they heard all this commotion of people, of fire, of wind, and they wanted to know what was going on. And they also heard this tremendous wind that was howling. And they heard the believers who were speaking in foreign tongues and so they asked each other how it could be that these were native Galileans and they were speaking in different languages and they were even able to understand some of what they were hearing themselves. What an amazing thing this scene was. The wind was howling, but it was the wind of God's spirit and they also saw that fire that was loose on that first Pentecost day, the fire that was fanned by the very wind of God. It is to be noted in this passage that only those who were alert to God's activity seemed to understand what was happening. The people who were outside the house where the believers were, were amazed and they were perplexed. They didn't have a clue of what was going on. Their only possible explanation for this whole event and what they were witnessing was the believers were drunk. They knew they had been accused of drinking the new wine. But the believers knew, they knew what was going on because they had been meeting daily for prayer and they had been worshiping. And as soon as the Holy Spirit descended upon them on that day of Pentecost, they knew Christ's promise was being fulfilled. Think about that. On this day so many, many years ago, on that first Pentecost Sunday, those believers realized that Christ's promise to come back to give them the Spirit was being fulfilled. When we are alert to God, we can see and we can hear things that other people miss. Most of us have had some experiences, or perhaps we know somebody that has, 
or at least we have read and heard about people who have had life-changing events and life-changing experiences that seems to have made them feel the presence of God at that time. Some of us have even been able to achieve things that we didn't know that we could achieve and we believe strongly that that was the result of the Spirit of God in our life. In other words, it was truly the winds of God blowing in our life at that time. What happens? What happens when winds of God blow across a person's life? <coughs> Two things. First of all, the mediocre can become magnificent. Things truly change that maybe you didn't expect to change. When the Holy Spirit came upon the believers, they were all transformed. They were transformed from a band of, of cowards, literally, of cowards. And they became courageous advocates of faith. Even poor, timid Peter, who was afraid, a genuine scaredy cat, he became a bold, spoken, outspoken, as it is, advocate of Christ. Think about the times that Jesus taught the disciples when they just didn't get it. And he told them over and over and over again, and they still didn't get it. And you know, I suspect at times he wondered, why did I choose you guys anyway? You just don't get it. You see, he spoke of humility. He spoke of service. And they reached for power. They were certain that he came to take Jerusalem by force. And yet he was saying, here is where I'm coming to die. Jesus spoke about his death and his resurrection, and yet Peter said, no, Lord, God forbid it. And then almost at the same time, Peter denied even knowing him. While Jesus was dying on the cross, <clears throat> Peter was out hiding somewhere fearing for his own life. All of these things change with the blowing of the wind of God. God's Spirit changed all those things. And Pentecost was Peter's great moment. He heard the remarks about the believers being filled with the new wine. And yet he now had courage and he stood before the crowd and he said, men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. These persons are not drunk as you say they are, for after all, it's only nine o'clock in the morning this was not the same Peter that we read about in the earlier Gospels and the Peter who denies Christ. He addressed the crowd with a boldness and even with eloquence. A mediocre life had become magnificent. That happens when the wind of God and the Spirit of God blows, a mediocre life can become magnificent. 
And perhaps, you know, we don't always realize all of the power that we have, you and me and all of us together. There is a story, a true story, that was written about a cardiologist who conducted an experiment in healing. His study included 393 seriously ill cardiac patients. From this group of 393, 192 were selected for special treatment. The special treatment was prayer. Selected people from around the country were chosen and asked to pray for each of these 192 patients. Their conditions were described in detail, so the person who was doing the praying knew what conditions they were praying for. They were able to focus their prayer on beneficial healing and quick recovery. These were the two main things they prayed for. The remaining patients, 201, were simply given the usual medical care without prayer. Ten months later, the results revealed a startling conclusion. The patients who were prayed for experienced markedly fewer incidents of cardiac-related infections, pulmonary edema, and mortality than did the 201 who were not prayed for. And it's important to note that those 192 who were receiving prayers were not even aware that they were being pray prayed for. They were not aware they were a part of a study. And the people praying had never met the subjects for whom they were asking divine help. If prayer can accomplish that great of a task, at such a wide difference and without people knowing what is going on, simply that they are praying for recovery for people, for people they didn't even know their names, they were just simply praying, but their prayers worked. If prayer can accomplish that at that distance, what might happen in our lives, your life, my life, and our church, if we're to pray for those close at hand, for those nearby, perhaps even for those that we know, lives could be transformed, and so would our church we do not always realize the power that we have at our disposal. And that power is called prayer. The mediocre can become magnificent. Sometimes even those things that are dead can come back alive. Walt Case was driving through the desert of one Texas one day in July. And if you've ever been out that way in July, you know how hot and dry it can be in West Texas. And as he drove through, he agonized for anybody or anything that would have to try to even live in that hot West Texas desert. And of when he was driving through, they had had a virtually rainless winter and spring, and so the desert was particularly parched, more so than normal. Worst in memory was the common observation of the locals. Then, six weeks later, 
and after five inches of rain, Walt retraced his trip through that desert, but now it was different. I saw a contrast that was nothing less than miraculous, he says. By mid-August, the desert is usually green from the summer rains, but this year it was positively luxuriant. Countless patches of brightly colored wild flowers dotted the roadside. The extremes were notable, even to those most familiar with the rebirth that the rain brings to the desert. And I like that concept and that idea, the rebirth that the rain brings to the desert can be much like the rebirth that the Spirit brings to you and to me, brings to the soul. This is what happens when a life bringing wind blows across the desert. This is also what happens when God's Spirit blows across our lives. We are refreshed, we're empowered, we're transformed. And so the question for this morning is, is there any wind in your life? Are we left now to row the boat slowly and painfully through the waters of life all by ourselves? Or may we put up our sails and catch the wind of God? Most of you probably know that the word for spirit and the word for wind are exactly the same in Hebrew. And I am here to tell you on this Pentecost Sunday, this birthday of the church, that the Spirit of God, the mighty wind of God, is always available to you and to me and to anyone else who desires it. Amen.